Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Lauren Kaufman. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about status check, navigating the diagnostic challenges and urgency to treat in status epilepticus. As I mentioned, I'm Lauren Kaufman. I'm a neurointensivist. I am at Temple University. I'm the medical director of the neurosciences ICU. I also serve as the associate program director. And I'm going to be joined by Dr. Cleo Rubinos, who will be sharing the slides with me. She's an assistant professor of neurocritical care and epilepsy um, at UNC Chapel Hill. She also serves as the co-director for the Global Health uh, Neurology Elective and director of the Acute Symptomatic Seizure Clinic at UNC. Today we're gonna to be going through some cases. You will see you'll have opportunities to uh, interact live and so we can kind of have uh, a two-way discussion as to what we, how we think we would approach these cases. We'll go through the importance of why we need to recognize status epilepticus and how we treat and we'll go through more of the pathophysiology and end with a few more cases. Just so I get an idea of who the audience is, can you raise your hand if you don't have a neurology background? Okay, so a fair amount, okay, so this should be great. So the purpose of this session, we're going to be talking about the epidemiology of status epilepticus, so you really get a sense for how common it is and why it's so important to recognize, um, because it is a neurologic emergency, time is brain, so we want to ho hopefully leave this session with a better understanding of how to recognize it, why it's important to recognize, and how we treat. So the way we'll be doing an interactive session is you can either scan this QR code, it should be on one of the flyers that was on your chair as well, or you can go to slido.com and enter in pound 8950360. I'll give you guys a moment to do that. Just as a reminder, if you're at a bad angle, you can just go to slido.com and enter in that code as well. And this is gonna be our test question to see if everyone's logged in appropriately. How many consecutive days did Phoenix have in 2023 with temperatures at or above 110 degrees? It's hard to imagine right now, given what the weather is, but why don't you put in your guess? Is everyone picking the same answer? Oh, okay, let's say So we have about 60 people in. The majority are saying 35. If I recall correctly, 31 is the correct answer, right? Okay, 31. Great, so everyone knows how to use Slido. So we'll start with um, a case. MJ is a 67-year-old woman. She has a history of a prior ischemic stroke and CKD who's admitted for fatigue, dysuria, fever, and confusion. On presentation, she's febrile, she's tachycardic, uh, her MAP is about 65. You can notice she's tachypnic, but she's saturating 94%. And on her initial labs, you do note she has a mild leukocytosis. Uh, it appears that she has an increase in her baseline creatinine. And uh, you send a UA, and it's positive for pseudomonas. You're waiting for susceptibilities. In the meantime, she gets admitted for urosepsis, and she started on cefepime. Three days later, her fever's resolved, her white count's normalized, but she's still altered. Her AKI is also worsening, and she's noted to be inuric. She is still breathing comfortably on room air. So when you think about this patient, what in your practice would make you think, okay, it's time to get a neurology consultation because I'm not sure why she's altered? So these, these are your options. The first option is, you know, we've identified a cause for this toxic metabolic encephalopathy. We don't need to work anything up further. Or she doesn't have any focal neurologic deficits. Therefore, there's nothing for us to investigate. Or only if um, we get imaging, there's something abnormal, will you call neurology? Or you just don't think she needs any neurologic investigation at all? Just gonna give it a moment. We have close to 50 respondents. So it seems like the majority of people are recognizing that um, there's persistent altered mental status and it's something that we do need to investigate further. 
about 11% of people did say they would wait until there's abnormal brain injury uh, imaging. And I think as a, hopefully as we continue, you'll note that that might be waiting too long. And you, you know, at some institutions, even a, a CT can take hours, an MRI, that can be days. And you do not want to wait that long until you figure out what's going on. So in this case, a neurology was called to check out MJ. And on exam, they noticed she's altered and has a gaze deviation. So what test do you think would be most helpful to sort out what's happening? A routine head CT, a stat head CT, a routine brain MRI, a stat brain MRI, a routine EEG or a stat EEG? I mean, you're at a talk where I think you know what the topic is, so hopefully that's a clue. And we can see that the majority of people are recognizing this is concerning for um, some kind of epileptiform activity on your exam. She's altered. She has a gaze deviation. So a STAT EEG is, you know, a very great idea. The next step, I, you know, some people would argue for getting at least a head CT, especially if there are risk factors for stroke, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic. The fact that she has a gaze deviation is a lateralizing feature. So if there are motor symptoms that are concerning for something vascular, you know, that would also be reasonable. Um, but likely, in my practice at least, I'm, I would maybe even get both. So a STAT EEG is placed, and MJ is found to be a non-convulsive status epilepticus. What is going to be your next best step? So we have some options with dosing here. Are you going to give 4 milligrams of lorazepam, 2 milligrams of lorazepam, 4 grams of levetiracetam, 2 grams of levetiracetam, or you're going to wait until your neurology colleagues kind of give you some recommendations? Okay, so this makes me actually really happy that we're, the majority of people are selecting four milligrams of lorazepam. As we'll um, speak uh, further when we talk about treatment recommendations, the dosing is 0.1 mg per kg total dosing and doses of up to four milligrams. Um, one of my personal pet peeves is when the emergency room calls and says, I gave a milligram of Ativan for the seizures. That is not adequate. Um, and as we hope you'll re recognize after this talk, time is brain. We want to be aggressively treating up front while we have that opportunity to try and get control of the seizures. So we're going to pivot now and talk about recognition and management of critically ill patients with status epilepticus. So what is status epilepticus? You know, there's some historical papers that will talk about uh, defining or at least describing seizures that go back to ancient times. Uh, and then there's a collective of some um, French physicians that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, go on to actually give a de better description of status epilepticus. However, it wasn't until 1964 when the ILE, which is the International League Against Epilepsy, came out with a definition. And at that time, most people were defining it as 20 to 30 minutes of seizures. And in more recent times, we've realized that's just far too long to have someone have a seizure. And as you'll see, the longer people seize, the worse outcomes they have. So this is just a collection of showing all the different um, practice guidelines and statements that have come out in the past decade or so that are endorsing this definition of five minutes of either uh, continuous clinical seizures or multiple seizures without a return to baseline. So I mean, if you think about your own clinical practice, that's a lot of the patients you're probably encountering. As I mentioned earlier, status epilepticus is a neurologic emergency. Um, another point I would really like to impress upon people is that just like we think in stroke, time is brain, and it's so critical that we assess them, uh, especially if we're going down the ischemic stroke pathway and they're a candidate for thrombolytic therapies, you should frame it in your mind that status epilepticus is just as much of a neurologic emergency. Uh, the overall incidence in the United States is reported to be about 18.3 uh, to 41 per 100,000 people. And there's significant morbidity and reduction in quality of life that's associated with survivors of status. Uh, there's about 11% that have disabling cognitive deficits. It increases your risk to go on and have um, development of epilepsy. And we know that up to 40% of adults that have status, their risk of mortality. Depending on what the underlying etiology is, um, how refractory the seizures are, and how long they've been exposed to therapeutic coma, um, that all worsens their outcome. And of course, these patients can stay in our ICUs for weeks or even months, and that's a huge uh, healthcare cost and burden to society.
When we think about potential etiologies, um, there's lots of ways you can break it up, whether you think about it temporally in terms of acute, subacute, chronic, or we can think about it versus non-neurologic and neurologic. So non-neurologic etiologies, some of the most common ones would be electrolyte abnormalities, drug either intoxication or withdrawal, systemic infection. And for neuro neurologic etiologies, a lot of them have to do with some kind of structural abnormality in the brain, whether it's acute ischemic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, hypoxic ischemic brain injury, traumatic brain injury, infection, brain tumors, and of course there are people that have epilepsy. So this is what we propose is just um, a good reminder of what the initial workup should be. Uh, always, ABCs, you're going to want to assess when the patient is arriving, get them on a monitor, make sure they're hemodynamically stable and protecting their airway. A CAT scan is usually a good idea at first, make sure there's none of those structural pathologies happening that would warrant um, additional treatment. And an EEG, just because someone has stopped their motor symptoms doesn't mean they're not seizing. And if you get to the point where they're intubated, they're paralyzed. You don't know if they're seizing until they're put on EEG. So it's one of the most critical pieces of information that you need to obtain. In terms of lab tests, there are some very simple and correctable things you might be able to identify. You want to rule out hypoglycemia. Check your basic uh, electrolytes, calcium, magnesium. And if someone is known to be an apple, uh, have epilepsy and take some kind of anti-seizure me medicine, please ask the emergency room to draw a level for that medication if it's available in for your facility, especially before they load with something, because that will be super helpful when you're trying to think about why this patient was having breakthrough seizures. And if it's unfortunate, they draw those levels after they've already been given something, because it's just that one piece of information that's super helpful in terms of sorting out what's going on. When you get into the other workup that's listed in the bottom box, it's really going to depend on the patient, the context, what's going on with them. You know, if you think there's something infectious going on, you'd want to get an MRI with without and likely a lumbar puncture. Um, if there's something toxic going on, ingestion, you would want to get a toxicology panel. There's a lot of other lab um, tests you can think about depending on the history. Uh, one to consult neurology. So these are all for the providers that aren't neurologists in here. Every hospital is different. I've been at some hospitals where if you order an EEG, that comes with a neurology consult. I know at my current institution, if anyone comes in seizing, that's a neurology consult. Uh, I think what you really have to recognize is what's your comfort level with managing these patients. Um, and if you need help, don't be afraid to ask. And at least be able to recognize that seizures are a possibility, evaluate if that's happening, and know what the initial steps are. So this kind of breaks down the difference between motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms for status epilepticus. Motor is what everyone's familiar with, even people outside of medicine, right? Because that's what you typically see in TV shows and movies is the people that are having motor phenomenon, whether it's generalized tonic-clonic movements, um, the classic oral elementary automatisms, abnormal eye movements. Um, but it can be very subtle. Uh, the, people can have non-motor symptoms with the predominance of uh, being altered mental status. And I know it's very vague, and as a neurologist, I, I hate that term, altered mental status, because it's not giving me a lot of information. But there's a whole spectrum that that can represent, all the way from being awake and altered to being totally obtunded and near comatose. Other features that should kind of trigger you to think that there could be non-convulsive status is there's some speech issues, there's myoclonus noted, even abnormal behavior. Um, you can have increased tone, hallucinations, things that you might typically attribute to being more delirium or um, psychiatric related. To dig into this a little bit further, this goes into the different subtypes of motor predominant versus non-motor predominant um, status epilepticus. So on the right, you'll see without motor, and so that would be non-convulsive status epilepticus. And traditionally, we tend to think about that with a coma or without a coma. With motor symptoms, the ones you're most commonly familiar with are probably convulsive or tonic, or for those that take care of patients with cardiac arrest um, and unfortunately suffer from hypoxic ischemic brain injury, a lot of those patients may go on to have myoclonic status epilepticus. A totally separate phenomenon that's um, newly being reported and recently had guidelines released is new onset refractory status epilepticus, NORS. And it is a special subset of status epilepticus where it's de novo, it's new onset, and where you're unable to identify any kind of cause. And this is important to think about because you go beyond the traditional um, anti-seizure medication algorithm for treatment, and you'll really can go quite far into getting into refractory treatment management as well as immunosuppressive therapy.
So non-convulsive status actually represents a pretty large proportion of patients um, that are, have status in the ICU. And the key thing to remember is people can come in with a convulsive status epilepticus and transition to non-convulsive. So that's one of those points why if someone is altered and you do not have an explanation, it's going to be super important to try and get your EEG hooked up. Of patients in the United States that were referred for an emergency EEG because they're altered, over a third of them were found to be in non-convulsive status. Over the past decade or two, there's a lot of data coming out where people that are in a general critical care medical ICU that are altered are connected to EEG, and they're actually found to be seizing. So there's um, a Swiss study that was a three-year observational study that found non-convulsive um, status was actually identified in 47% of patients. And then uh, toxic metabolic encephalopathy is kind of one of these bucket terms that, you know, you get a neurology consult and they're going to say that. You still want to work out, make sure there's nothing else going on, because even a proportion of those patients, up to 8%, can actually be a non-convulsive status. So we talked about how it can be super difficult to identify non-convulsive status because altered mental status itself can be caused by so many different things, right? Whether it's neurologic or non-neurologic. So just keep it on your differential list for someone, especially when it's unexplained mental status. The guidelines actually recommend obtaining an EEG for patients where you don't have an overt cause for why someone is altered. This um, chart right here in the x-axis is actually showing time. And on the y-axis, it's the percentage of patients that are being discharged with the diagnosis. This bottom green line is altered consciousness. This next line up is subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the top one is seizure status. So you can see over time, likely as EEG is becoming, uh, capabilities are more uh, prevalent and accessible, we are making more of these diagnoses. But I thought, think it's also interesting to think about like this section here. Like, these disease processes were already happening. We just weren't recognizing them and diagnosing them. Therefore, the incidence of status um, is likely even higher, especially non-convulsive status, than you're seeing here. So the challenges of diagnosing it is really the lack of awareness that it's even a possibility and that it can be super subtle to pick up some of the signs. So uh, when it comes to treating, uh, diagnosing and treating status epilepticus, I tend to think about it in terms of like a parallel algorithm where you're doing multiple things at once. You're thinking it's a possibility of diagnosis and you're initiating getting testing for that. You're gonna start treating it and you're gonna be thinking about what's causing it. So you're thinking about all these things in parallel, keeping in mind, not all of these things are gonna be happening in real time, right? So like, I could want this medication and order it, but it has to get approved by the pharmacist, it has to get released from the pharmacy, depending on what part of the hospital you're at, it might not be available in your Pixis. So it can be super helpful to have a status epilepticus alert system within your institution, it's something we are working on now in uh, an effort to expedite treatment for these patients. When it comes to treatment, uh, we tend to think of break it up into different categories. We have first line emergent treatment, second line urgent, and third line urgent. So for our first um, category on the left, our emergent treatment, we're probably when people are coming in from EMS, they're traditionally getting midazolam. It's because it can be given IM, and it doesn't require the refrigeration that lorazepam requires. Um, if you're working in the hospital, traditionally you will be giving lorazepam, and as I previously mentioned, it's 0.1 mg per kg, and you can give up to four milligrams per dose. Please do not be afraid to give this dose. We have had multiple occasions where there are patients on a different service in our hospital that are seizing, and we give recommendations to the service of the amount of lorazepam to administer, and they're too nervous and they underdose. And I think the biggest um, concept to understand is if you dose appropriately and are able to abort the seizures, their mental status may actually improve. So obviously you're monitoring them, you're keeping an eye on the airway, but you want to be dosing appropriately. Now, this comes back into our parallel treatment algorithm. While you're ordering and giving your benzodiazepine therapy, you already want to know what your next best step is. So you should be ordering your next medication and facilitating that being dispersed. You have, you know, in terms of epilepsy medications, there's a plethora of medications that are available. However, we have a very limited amount that can be given through an IV formulation and rapidly titrated to a therapeutic level. Uh, I'd say for most of us, le levetiracetam is probably the most common, our first go-to option. Again, please dose appropriately. The emergency room was always calling us and say, I loaded with Keppra, and I said, how much did you give? And it's a gram. And I have to remind them, that's not a load. Um, so th that's point one. Point two with levetiracetam that people sometimes forget 
your maintenance dose will be dosed um, based on renal function. However, your initial load should be the same no matter what the renal function is. So please remember, a 16 mg per kg up to 4,500. Obviously, um, phosphonatoin, valproate are great options. Phenobarbital, you know, it's probably used more often in pediatric epilepsy, but you shouldn't really, in most situations, be using that as a first-line medication. If someone's still seizing, that's when you're thinking about proceeding with intubation and uh, anesthetic therapy. Uh, your options are really midazolam and propofol. Pentobarbital is, you know, very se severe and significant um, side effect profile, including uh, it's immunosuppressive, it can cause an ileus. We actually don't even have it on formulary at our hospital. It's really reserved for very few cases of re super refractory status, typically. Um, but the point to be aware of in terms of dosing for the midazolam and propofol, are these doses are significantly higher than you would be typically seeing in the medical ICU or used for general sedation. So if you think about it, um, midazolam, you know, maintenance infusion could be a mg per kg per hour. If you have a 75 kilogram person, that's 75 milligrams an hour of midazolam. So I've seen other people just be so uncomfortable in dosing this. So but that's what the appropriate therapy is. The other thing to keep in mind is um, you should have order sets that make it easy to identify what and how we're titrating. Because when people are in the ICU, they're typically on sedation that you titrate to RAS, their level of consciousness, right? But for these patients, we're gonna be in way higher doses and they should be titrated to either seizure suppression or birth suppression, depending on what your hospital protocol is. I see people taking pictures, but this is on the infographic that's on your chair as well. So you'll have a printed copy. So we've kind of identified why it's important to diagnose status epilepticus, how we initiate treatment, but what happens if we're not successful in treating it? What happens is it can actually progress. It can go from status epilepticus to refractory status epilepticus in a significant amount of cases. Uh, what qualifies as refractory status is you, they've, someone that's received benzodiazepine and an anti-seizure medication, but those have to be at adequate doses. Anecdotally, or at least in my practice, this is the most of the patients that I end up seeing that come to the ICU, right? They've received their Ativan or uh, midazolam, they've gotten their Keppra, and they're still seizing. Um, the next step, if they continue to seize, is super refractory status. So this is when they've received their benzodiazepine, their anti-seizure medication, and they're now intubated on sedation, and you've tried to wean that sedation after about a day, and they're still seizing. And these patients can be very difficult to control. You might have to go to more aggressive and refractory refractory therapies such as ketamine or pentobarbital, or depending on the underlying etiology, thinking about some immunosuppressive therapy. And why is this important? You know, we want to prevent people from going down this pathway of refractory and super refractory status because there's higher mortality. They're clearly going to stay in the hospital and ICU longer. They have greater rehab needs. That's if they leave the ICU. Um, and they're less likely to return to, to their baseline functional status. So it's not surprising that when patients are on high amounts of um, anesthetic therapy, whether it's propofol or midazolam, they're at risk for bad outcomes, whether it's infectious complications. These patients oftentimes need pressor support. They're obviously being ventilated. Um, if they survive, they're at higher um, risk of having uh, outcomes or new disability, and there's a higher risk of mortality. So I'll be now handing over to Dr. Rubinho, who will continue the next uh, several slides. Thank you so much. And this working, right? Okay. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to be talking about time is brain. And we're going to do a deep, a deep dive into why type is, uh, time is brain and the pathophysiology underlying the importance of the acuteness of the treatment of this neurological emergency. We talked already about status epilepticus definition in terms of time. But I also want to focus into the operational definition that was given to us by the International League Against Epilepsy in 2014. This operational definition is used T1 and T2 uh, to different like uh, pragmatic definitions to tell us what is happening in the patient's brain. With T, uh, time one or T1 is when the failure of the mechanisms responsible for seizures termination or from the initiation of mechanisms that need that lead to abnormality prolonged seizures are continue. T1 pretty much means that either the brake is failing or either the acceleratory or pedal is keep on acting, that is going to give you an impending um, seizure uh, continuation that is not going to be self-stopped uh, by the patient and what you need to start acting acutely and start your management immediately. 
And T2, it comes into when you have the long-term outcomes. After T2, you start having neuronal death and also neuronal death work rearrangement that is going to prone the patient into have risk for having epilepsy as a complication after having a status epilepticus. And T2 is a crucial indicator which is telling you that you must have a stop a status epilepticus at that moment in order to prevent poor outcomes in these patients. And these types, or these T1 and T2 times, are different by semiology of a status epilepticus. In tonic-clonic, in the convulsive status epilepticus, T1 is five minutes, so it's really, really fast, right? And if you imagine their patients coming from the ER, they come more than five minutes already. And for T2 in tonic-clonic, is 30 minutes. For focal status epilepticus with impaired consciousness, T1 is 10 minutes, and for T2 is more than 60 minutes. And the ones that we see most commonly in the ICU are going to be the focal status epilepticus with impaired consciousness, but also the absence of status epilepticus. Dr. Kaufman has said a lot of these patients will have any clinical um, manifestation, but it will be comatose for what EEG is needed. And for the absence of status epilepticus, T1 is between 10 to 15 minutes. And for T2, we don't have a definition. But it also tells you that t, you know, those 10 minutes means that you put an EEG and you have to start treating the patients immediately. So you have to be in coordination with neurology or epileptologists. Now, what is happening at a molecular level? Right? We know that status epilepticus is a continuum. And you can see that line in yellow to red. Status epilepticus has different stages, for impending to establish to refractory and super refractory. And it goes into the redness area when you have more neuronal death and more long-term consequences. In a molecular level, we know by animal studies that within milliseconds, there is protein phosphorylation. There's ionic channels opening and closing, and there's a neuromodulator of the GABA-A receptors. You have GABA-A receptors in the synaptic cleft, and you have GABA-A receptors that are extrasynaptically. The ones that are in a synaptic cleft are benzodiazepine sensitive, which is the one that are going to be uh, upon with our first line medication. And the ones that are extra synaptically are the ones that are benzodiazepine insensitive. But what happens is within the first minutes, you're going to have a down regulation of the GABA A. There's going to be an endosome, and there's going to be a you know, down regulation of these GABA A receptors, which in animal studies have shown that this happens within 20 minutes, about 25% of these receptors are going to be gone. And within an hour, about like 50% of these patients, these receptors, which means, again, into like when the patients come to the ER or come to the ICU, it's already more than 20 minutes or so. So you're already acting with very little of the GABA receptors in the synaptic cleft. And then subsequently, as the status epilepticus continue, you're going to have an upregulation of the NMDA receptors, and also you're going to have a difference trafficking in the APTA receptors. And these two receptors are receptors of hyperexcitability. And these two things that happen in a molecular level are going to give you a disbalance of the homeostasis between the inhibitory and the excitatory mechanisms favoring the excitatory for what status epilepticus or seizure is going to be self-sustained. But now, not only at the molecular level, we also can see a systemic overdrive. You can also see clinically changes in the patients that happen as the status epilepticus continue. And these systemic complications driven by the systemic overdrive are going to be manifest into increase of blood pressure, increase of heart rate. You're going to have uh, neurocardiogenic syndromes with AKG changes, as well as uh, echocardiogram should be also um, ordered in patients with the status epilepticus. You're going to have musculoskeletal injury and also acute renal injury. As well, you're going to have neuronal damage, as we already spoke about that like D2. In the, in the next slides, I will show you more about the neuronal damage that you can see in our patients. And multiple factors in generally are the ones that influence the outcomes of a status epilepticus. We have done extensive uh, evidence and research in this matter. And one of the um, risks can be modifiable, and some of the risks can be non-modifiable, to put it that way. The ones that are not modifiable are the patient characteristics, right? The patient etiology, the brain injury by itself. The patient already have a first hit with the first primary brain injury, traumatic ischemic stroke. Um, the age, older age patients have less, in general, reserve for recovery. You know, the index of comorbidity, the Charleston index of comorbidity, uh, or Apache scores. And those are, you cannot go back in time and change those modifiable. However, the ones that are modifiable are the time to diagnose and the time to treat and also the use of less IV anesthetic medications, meaning treating early these patients so you don't have to escalate into refractory status epilepticus uh, pathways. And you know, these ones are, of course, the treatment delay and the duration of the status epilepticus are gonna be the ones that are gonna 
affect also patient outcomes, but the ones that all of us can actually act upon and help our patients preventing worse outcomes. So we know that different etiologies with brain injury is structural, but also non-structural, and we commonly see up to 20% of patients in, with sepsis in the medical ICU can have status epilepticos. This one can be associated with worse outcome. We know that patients that have hypoxic brain injury, or ischemic strokes, or hemorrhagic strokes, or also trauma, they have all different types of incidents, and these populations are actually quite seen to have this as a consequence secondary to the primary brain injury, either structural or no structural, as I said. And going deep into explaining you guys, you know, why there's also neuronal brain injury, like to give you the evidence behind why we are like so focused into time is brain with the status epilepticos and not only with ischemic stroke, and we have done a great job treating and giving TPA or TNK, is that we have animal studies that have shown that there's going to be a flow metabolism mismatch coupling with a metabolic crisis that's happening in the patient's brain, but also systemically speaking. I already mentioned about the hypertension, but you can also have decreased blood pressure that is going to increase your ischemia penumbra in our unaided brains. You're going to have also hypoxia that is going to cause you hippocampal damage in the long term, as hippocampus is one of the highest metabolic uh, demand within our brain. You can have also dysregulation in temperature, hyperthermia, which is going to further enhance the neuronal damage. You can also have blood the, uh, permeability dysregulation, which is going to cause you hyposmolarity changes and shifted. And we know that a happy brain in brain injury is a salty brain. And the prior slide was all about uh, animal studies, but we also have clinical studies that have shown that patients that have electrographic seizures or non convulsive status epilepticos can have metabolic crisis. We have a big study for traumatic brain injury for Dr. Vespa. We showed that in patients with traumatic brain injury that have electrographic seizures, there was an increase in the intracranial pressure, and that can also increase ischemia. There was an increase in the brain lactate to pre-ovate ratio, which is telling you that this brain is going from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, so it's brain in more injury. You also have increased of glycerol, which is a marker for cellular membrane breakdown. But also in patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, electrographic seizures have been seen to increase the hematoma expansion, so hematoma expansion, and also increase midline shift. And not only in patients that have already primary brain injuries, we have seen all these uh, uh, secondary metabolic crisis or neuronal damage. We know we have a beautiful study that was one of the first uh, publications uh, about refractory or super refractory status epilepticos in the literature. It was 19 cases. It came from Mayo Clinic by uh, Sarah Hawker, in which at different time points, they did MRIs into the same patient. So the same patient was their own control. To show us a proof of concept that it was not only animal experiments, it was not a neuronal network or neuronal uh, cell level, but also in a structural brain. And I want you guys to focus into the three images that we have here for the MRI of this patient. This patient was in the 20s and gave with a new refractory status epilepticos. And you can see the baseline by the first picture we have here. There you go. And you can see how like, full and beautiful the brain is. You see some sulcation. As you, I mean, as all of us have sulcation, but it's minimally delineated because this patient is in the 20s. And you see the ventricular areas that are actually like, very small and thin as it should be. But as it goes, you can see how the atrophia, that's diffuser by atrophia, of course. And you see the sulcations are more demarcated. And if you became a neurologist, you can think this MRI looks like a person like, in the 80s. So over time, this patient have not only neuronal injury at a cellular level, but also at a structural level. And this patient was in his 20s, a patient that had good brain reserve. Now we also have a study for the febrile status epilepticos cohort. Febrile status epilepticos happen mostly in kids. And they show different images as well as the time will go into status epilepticos in these kids, and show that there was focal atrophia in certain areas, such as the hippocampus and basal ganglia, that are high metabolic rate demand cells, but also subcortical white matter, corpus callosum, and cerebellum in kids. Again, the population that have more brain reserve. But in our medical ICU, surgical ICU, neurocritical care, normally our patients are in the 60s, in the 70s, they have less brain reserve. I think we're familiar with lung reserve. It's the same concept with brain reserve. So having a second hit in these patients that outcome for recovery or their hope for recovery is a little bit less. And that's why time is brain. And that's why interventions such as the one that we have to do for recognition and treatment is very, very needed. Now let's talk about seizure duration and seizure burden as an outcome that we can manage and change, uh, as a measure that we can manage and change for patients' outcomes. We have here a couple of studies. One of them 
was done in a patient that had a stroke, and they developed post-stroke status epilepticos. And after they corrected with all the confounders variables, they noticed that if the status epilepticos lasted more than 12 hours, was an independent predictor of an unfavorable outcome um, a discharge, which was uh, measured by death or a new neurological uh, finding that it was not explained by the stroke. And we have another study. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is a review of the literature. They will compile data and they show that in different patient populations, if the status epilepticos lasted more than 60 minutes, it was associated with highest mortality. But now 12 hours and 60 minutes sounds like a lot, right? And I already had told you guys, 20 minutes you had these regulations, T1, T2. So later on we had a more comprehensive study that was done by Payne in 2014. And this is a landmark study for all of us that take care of patients with status epilepticos. Because what they wanted to prove is they wanted to see the relation between surgery burden and neurological outcomes in kids. And they measured by the pediatric cerebral um, performance category. And they associate and see the, patient, uh, the seizure burden in all these childs. And they saw that as the seizure burden rose, the likelihood of worse neurological out outcomes also rose. And the threshold was achieved at 20% of an hour of seizures. They saw that when you have 20% of seizures within one hour, so that means 12 minutes of seizures in an hour, is when you have a steep change or risk of having worse neurological outcomes in kids. And this 12% doesn't have to be, I'm sorry, 20%, 12 minutes. This 12 minutes doesn't have to be continuously. If you see an epoch, an EEG of an hour, and you see seizure here, seizure here, seizure here, and you add them all, and all of them are 12 minutes, that's a seizure burden that you have to be afraid of because it's gonna be associated with worse outcomes in your patients. And we also have, and this was done in kids, but this is extrapolated, and because of this study, is the ICU EEG terminology for 2021 has established the diagnosis of electrographic status epilepticos to be more than 20 minutes in our epoch. But we also have another study that used, that um, was done in patients with superacnoid hemorrhage, that saw that for every hour of seizure measured by continuous EEG, there were 10% increased odds of unfavorable three months outcomes. And also there was a worse in the TICS score, the TICS is for cognitive uh, outcomes uh, in these patients. So it's telling you that functionality is affected and 20% for electrographic status epilepticos is what we have to be aware of. Now, despite our best effort into like proving that seizures are bad for our brain and time is brain and we have to do early management, we still um, oversee this time is brain uh, sentence and the optimal management for status epilepticos around the centers is actually a bit delayed. More than 30 minutes delay for the first line therapy has been reported in up to 65% of status epilepticos patients. And not only the first, delay, the first line therapy, but also the second line therapy. And we know that about 30% of our patients are gonna be refractory to benzodiazepine. And we know also by the by Kapoor study for the ESSE trial, that 50% of our patients are gonna be refractory to the second um, antecedent medication that was used, valproacid, levetiracetam, and phenytoin or phosphenytoin. So it tells you that already our patients are gonna have with some comorbidities or some damage in the neuronal network that are gonna be refractory. So for what we have to be sure that we can do something for them, which is like the early interventions and give these medications as early and not be so as, as delay. Because this delay is gonna be associated with worse outcome by twofold increase of a risk of post-stroke epilepsy. A lot of these patients won't have with epi will come with epilepsy and the neuronal derangement that happens with the status epilepticos continuation is gonna also cause you epilepsy as a side effect. And we know that epilepsy patients can be also re-hospitalization, can have multi-medications, uh, multi, multi, multi so it's, uh, it's also a concern. We also know that the delay in treatment uh, give you a low rate of good outcome on discharge, and they had been, uh, they had been measure the outcome in different type of uh, scores, like modified Rickett score or CPC or GOOS. And we also know that it's gonna have an increased delay in consciousness. But also importantly, is that as we don't treat early with a first a second line, we're gonna be having a refractory status epilepticos. For what we're gonna be using IV anesthetics, and you guys already know that IV anesthesia is associated with worse outcome and comorbidities, trach and peg, and uh, you know, pressure ulcers. 
So as I hope that with this, we have shown you that time is brain and why it's important to treat these patients acutely, that with an acute, uh, a fast diagnosis, but also a, f a fast treatment. And now we're going to go to discuss a little more of cases to see how much you have learned from us. Please do a good job. <laughs> um, so we will be getting back to talk about MJ, who we previously discussed, and do at least one other case. In the meantime, if you look at some of the um, sheets that were listed on your chair, there is a way to enter in any questions that you may have, so we can have time to answer those after we finish this case and do one more. So we're going to head back to MJ. She was the case we started with. She was admitted for urosepsis. Um, she's already been given her benzodiazepines, her keprolod. She's being dosed appropriately. And after receiving those medications, she was on EEG and found to be a non-convulsive status. So the question for you is, what is your next best step? Do you think it's time to intubate and start propofol, titrate to RAS? Do we want to intubate, start propofol, titrate to seizure succession or suppression? administer lacosamide, we're going to add a second um, agent, or third agent, really, um, or just wait, talk to neurology, and get some further recommendations. Okay, it seems, it seems like we do have a majority here that which is just on point. We're going to intubate, start propofol, and titrate to seizure secession, or birth suppression. There's some controversy over that depending on who you ask, and some epilepsy groups might do one versus the other. Um, you know, once you get to that point, depending on what the EG is showing, it may or may not be reasonable to add lacosamide, but you should continue down the pathway of intubation and adding an anesthetic agent first. Um, Again, we talked about the importance of titrating to the electrographic uh, findings and not a RAS. So these will be higher doses of medications than you're typically used to seeing. Um, and of course, if you do need assistance, you want to be calling your colleagues. They will come help you sort out what's going on. But don't defer at least initial therapy up front. Now, what do you think is the most likely etiology for MJ's non-convulsive status epilepticus? Her, her remote stroke, urosepsis, Cephapeme neurotoxicity, it's cryptogenic, we don't know, or meningitis. This is interesting. Okay, so a lot of people are responding cephapeme neurotoxicity, and that for sure could be one of, I think there's a few of these you could argue for. So cephapeme neurotoxicity, it's something to think about in someone that's admitted to ICU, has renal dysfunction, is on cephapeme, they're persistently altered, having seizures. Um, if I do have a patient, uh, they, they might not have even been come in with a status or some other neurologic entity. So this could be nuance at seizures in the sad setting of cephapeme toxicity. It's something to think about to get them on EEG, rule that out, and maybe consider if you have any other antimicrobial options. Um, Eurosepsis, so you could argue there's systemic infection that, you know, is can be related to causing press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, which could cause seizures, so that's an alternative. I would have expected more people to say remote stroke, because that's what comes to my mind first. Post-stroke epilepsy is a very cause, a, um, common cause of epilepsy, um, especially as people age. Uh, I think we have multiple reasons or things to think about as causing this, so I wouldn't say cryptogenic. And there wasn't much in the history that's suggestive of um, meningitis, though she did not get a lumbar puncture. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Binos to handle the next case study. I think we're the same. Hmm? Okay. That sounds good. So we have, um, oh yes, I'm sorry, for, so, for some reason I thought we have another slide for the prior case. So then we have a different patient, it's JV, it's a 54-year-old male admitted to the medical ICU with influenza type A. His score has been complicated with ARDS, requiring prolonged intubation, also had pulmonary embolism for why he's on, on a heparin infusion now, and he had acute kidney injury, but that has resolved, and that's not an issue anymore. But for the management of ARDS, the patient has required sedation, right, to prevent, to, um, to give better oxygenation, and he was in a propofol infusion up to seven micrograms per kilogram per minute for four days. JV, JV is weaned on sedation and remains comatose. So which of the following is on your differential for etiology of JV, JV's continued comatose state? And these are the answers. Is it either because sedation accumulation, because of hypoactive delirium, because of non-convulsive status epilepticus, because of an acute ischemic stroke, or because of an acute hemorrhagic stroke? 
sedation, long time on sedation, high dose. He had an AKI, has resolved. We're stopping, and now he's not really waking up. We don't have a good exam. What's going on? Sounds good. It's OK. AKI is not a problem anymore, but I can see how some people think that there is still some sedation accumulation as a lack of metabolism for the days that the patient was on AKI. OK, I see that some of us, some people have been very attentive and listening to my talk about no convulsive status epileptical. High five for that, guys. You're going to have a sticker on the way out. And <laughs> I see some people concerned about hypoactive delirium, and then other people concerned about acute hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. So yeah, one of the things is I have to make sure that there's nothing that is structural, right? This patient has been sedated for a very long time. You know, it's a patient that also have ARDS and had a PE and it's on heparin drip, hypercoagulable state, right? It can also happen to be, it's getting cozy in here. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fall asleep, we're about to finish. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it can also have a stroke, right? But also the patient was on heparin drip. You know, it can also have a bleed. So a CAT scan should be done immediately. And then, but the CAT scan didn't show any intracranial hemorrhage, or any uh, strokes. So how long after a stopping, OK, has no stroke, no hemorrhage. How long after stopping sedation will you wait to consult neurology and or order an EEG for concerns of status epilepticos? Less than 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours, more than 72 hours, I will not consult neurology or order EEG. You know, the people that answer the last, the, I mean, the get the last uh, option are the ones that are not here in this, in this talk. So you guys can go and brag about this, this talk with all your colleagues. Excellent, less than 24 hours. And there's a majority. Time is brain. You know, yes. And some people, I can see how some people want to wait at least 24 hours, right? Resource utilization, we probably don't have a lot of machines, right, um, that we can use. But honestly, just have a snap, you know, put an EEG for two or three hours. If the patient is status epilepticus and is the reason why this comatose, you will see it right away. So you can put it within two hours, and if it's not ceasing, you take it out. And your resource utilization is already used wisely. But yes, definitely, status epileptic is a big concern for this patient. And immediately, within less than 24 hours, EEG or neurology should be consulted for this patient. Now that we know that the CAT scan is negative. Now, this is going to vary because we all have different settings. But once consult is requested, what is a typical time to neurology consult? And this is just like for us to know and get to know you guys a little bit better. because some. You know, some institutions doesn't have a neurology in-house. Um, some is like consult and e-consult. Just want to see the audience. It's more like a demographic type of question. So you see the majority is answering that they have availability of neurologists within 24 to 7 hours. So that's like, you know, that's a... Um, uh, that's, that's really good, and please use that, especially with patients like the one that we have. Uh, some patients, uh, some, uh, not patients, you guys, well, you can be patient too, but some of the audience show that uh, um, the typical time for neurology consult is like 12 to 11, 24 hours, so you're able to do it, and then 24 to 48 hours. Uh, uh, a little bit of, uh, of you guys. So I see a variety of availability for uh, neurology consult amongst all of you. So we're going to go for the case three study, and then... All the time. So we have talked a lot because we want you guys, yeah, we want you guys to have all the knowledge. We can discuss the cases all the time, but we're gonna go to conclusions and then we can have some time for questions. So, you know, the four points I, I would like you guys to take home with you is that status epilepticus is really common and is one of the most common neurological emergencies seen in the United States and worldwide. And this is associated with high morbidity, mortality, and healthcare costs. You know. Although some patients can have subtle symptoms, like hip pus, like eye twitching, not all of them are going to have. And non convulsive status epilepticos can be often be missed in our critical ill patients. And EEG monitoring is the only one thing that we can use in order to diagnose it. We already have shown you the evidence with the preclinical and the clinical data that show that convulsive and non convulsive status epilepticos cause neuronal injury, cell death, and secondary brain injury. And our patients already have poor brain reserve to begin with. And of course, most importantly, what we can do, right, as a physicians and providers, early diagnosis and rapid and effective sustained status epilepticus management that we can actually balance and give our patients a best outcome.
So I think this is kind of the last conclusion slide before we move on to some questions. So, you know, I think one of the key points here is that the past couple decades, we've had a lot of advances in critical care, neurocritical care, um, you know, a lot of, we're think about all the advances we have in vascular neurology, and we have this new technology where we can monitor people, we have AI software, but the morbidity and mortality for status epilepticus really hasn't moved significantly despite all these advances. So if people can remember, it's gonna be super important to think about it, recognize it, and, and initiate treatment quickly. We hope that that can eventually lead to more positive um, outcomes for our patients. And overall, it will really reduce uh, these costs for our healthcare systems because these people can often stay in the hospital for months at a time. And then if they do survive, they often go on to different kinds of skilled nursing facilities um, and it can be a not so great outcome. So before we get to questions, I would like to thank everyone for coming. 